On November 26th, November 26, 2008, terrorists simultaneously attacked about a dozen locations in Mumbai, India, including one of the most iconic buildings in the city, the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel. For two nights and three days, the Taj was under siege, held by men with automatic weapons who took some people hostage, killed others, and set fire to the famous dome of the hotel. The siege of the Taj quickly became an international story because of its employees. In one location of the hotel, about 35 Taj Mumbai employees, led by a 25-year-old banquet manager, Malika, were assigned to manage the event in a second floor banquet room. Around 9.30, as they served the main course, they heard what was thought to be the fireworks at a nearby wedding. In reality, these were the first gunshots from terrorists who were storming the Taj. The staff quickly realized something was wrong. Malika, the 25-year-old girl, charge of the banquet, had the doors locked and the lights turned off. She asked everyone to lie down quietly under the tables and refrain from using their cell phones. She insisted that husbands and wives separate to reduce the risk to families. The group stayed there all night listening to the terrorists rampaging through the hotel, hurling grenades, firing automatic weapons, and tearing the place apart. The Taj staff kept calm according to the guests, and it constantly went around offering water and asking people if they needed anything else. Early in the next morning, a fire started in the hallway outside, forcing the group to climb out the windows, and a fire crew was spotted them and helped them out using ladders. When asked, Malika said, it was my responsibility. I may have been the youngest person in the room, but I was still doing my job. Elsewhere in the hotel, at the Japanese restaurant that they had in that hotel, Wasabi, it was busy again at 9.30, a warning call came from the hotel operator alerting the staff that terrorists had entered the building and were headed toward the restaurant. A 48-year-old man named Thomas Varghese, a Malayali, the senior waiter of Wasabi, immediately instructed his 50-odd guests to crouch under the tables, and then he directed his employees to make a human wall around the guests. A call came in saying that they should try to escape. So Thomas Varghese directed the guests to go first, then his employees, and then finally him. But the terrorists gunned him down as he reached the bottom of the staircase. Other employees of the Taj, they were they escaped, but after escaping, they, ran, they would run back in to go save more and more guests. The hotel operators would stay in the midst of gunfire around them, calling as many rooms as possible to let them know to get out as soon as possible. This incident is terrible, but it created an international story because the employees of the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel acted completely opposite from what regular human beings feel that they should. When gunfire is around you, why would you go back in? When you are earning the, well, the salary of a, of a waiter in Mumbai, why would you risk and make a human wall around the guests that you have no attachment to. So many of the, of the uh, news reporters and other studies came to do a report on this and to try to figure out what happened. The Harvard Business Review, one of the, a good magazine on business, they sent reporters to Mumbai and they interviewed all of the, the staff they interviewed all of the management, and they tried to figure out what was different about this hotel and what was different about these employees. 
And the management had no idea. They were completely as surprised with the actions of their employees as the rest of the world. But the Harvard Review, Business Review came out with a discovery of something different about what the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel did when they hired people. There's two steps to this. First, they hired people that were different. In what way? They didn't hire students out of the tier one schools. They didn't hire the best of the best, the cream of the crop. They hired specifically tier two schools. From those tier two schools, they hired these people. And what they would look for is one, the students or the, the new employees would not, would hopefully come from smaller areas. Instead of hiring from Mumbai or Chennai, they would hire from Pune. Instead of hiring from the big cities, they would hire from the rural areas. They looked for certain things. They didn't look for the best grades, but when they hired, they looked for respect of elders and teachers. They looked for a quality that we often forget, the quality of humility, considering others having discipline. And in those values, they hired, but they not only hired, they rewarded their staff when they exhibited those same behaviors. So that when crisis came, these simple people, waiters, waitresses, busmen, busboys, and, and call operators, when crisis came, those people were not just anything, they were heroes. What makes a hero? What makes a hero is humility. Kids are looking around, and you guys want to hear the word hero nowadays, you're thinking about all those movies. Watch any of those movies. Watch any of those Marvel or DC movies. And what do you find? Each of the superheroes have to go through one thing. They have to go through a period of humility, of being broken down and losing their power or losing something that makes them in crisis. And in that crisis, when they find the humility to realize that there's something bigger than themselves, they end up serving and being the hero that they are called to be. Today's gospel is about heroes. Because today's gospel is about Mary and Elizabeth. Not our common day heroes, the things that we think of Superman or Wonder Woman or any of those, but they are greatest of heroes. They're first of all real, <laughs> but also, it is their hero, hero, heroism that is, allows us to come to this church and worship. And their heroism is defined with one characteristic, and that is humility. When Elizabeth, Elizabeth, who is the senior in the relationship, the aunt, the great auntie, who's older, sees Mary, her younger niece, come in. How does Elizabeth respond? Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Elizabeth realizes that Mary, in her humility, deserves blessing. Think about a pregnant woman. Think about if you were pregnant yourself. Elizabeth is pregnant further along than Mary. Elizabeth is probably going through some tough time because she's very old and she's having this baby. And in having this baby, she might be in pain. She might not be feeling well. And yet in her greeting, she blesses Mary, the younger, who probably doesn't even look like she's pregnant yet. And there's a realization here that Mary and Elizabeth, they have something that, cho that God chose. When God chooses employees, when he chooses who he wants to hire, when he chooses what he wants in the, in, in, in the people that he calls to be in his service, he looks for that quality, humility. That's what Mary and Elizabeth had. 
Mary, in so much, sings the song of praise. For he, our God, has regarded the lowly state of his servant, of his slave. Because I am God's slave, is how Mary looks at it. She realizes that there is something greater than herself. And when she looks, not just at God, when she looks at every other person that comes her path, she sees what? She sees someone deserving more. She sees someone that deserves God's love. And because she has that humility not to put herself above anyone else, she becomes the conduit of God's salvation. My brothers and sisters, what do we value? Do we value humility? Or are we pushing our kids to be the best of the best, the first, the top tier, getting the best grades? And when we're doing all of that, pushing them to be the best, are they learning the true things of virtue? The things that, in crisis, create heroes. Do we ourselves exhibit those same virtues? Do we exhibit patience? Do we exhibit humility? My brothers and sisters, we are at a point in our society where we are the me generation. Where everything is about me. Everything is for me. And we think about only ourselves. And we have to realize that we have a wave of culture to battle. And that culture is destroying us. Because when we focus on ourselves and become selfish, we lose sight of the ability to work for God. Because God wants selfless people. God forbid. Something in this church would have happened. How would you react? God forbid something were to happen to any of us. How would we react? Would our reaction be like Malika, Thomas Vargas? Would we have the courage of Mary, the fortitude of Elizabeth? Can we rely on our God to give us that patience? Can we look to him and see the example that he created? The example that he shows to each and every one of us. That on the night of his passion, he not only broke bread, but what did he do before he broke the bread? He took his disciples, sat them down, and said, I am going to wash your feet. And the master became the servant that day. And in becoming the servant, he shows us the way to salvation. The way to live. A new way of life. A life that is not about me. A life that is about we. A life in which we serve each other. When we start to complain in our daily lives, when we start to go off and become selfish, I want you to think about Mary and Elizabeth. I want you to remember the example that Christ gives us in washing the feet of his disciples. And remember to think about others, to be humble, to be patient, and the most important, to love. My brothers and sisters, let us be filled with that love that we might serve others regardless of what our caste is, what we deserve, how much money we make, how great we are, what family we come from. Each of us are called to be servants of God. Let us go and serve with humility. All glory and honor to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit.